Rajesh Mehta is the co-founder and first elected chairman of NASCOM, the founder of Onward Technologies, and now also the author of a best-selling book called The Maverick Effect. Tell us a little bit about The Maverick Effect. It chronicles the beginning and the rise of India's IT revolution. Uh, NASCOM has played such a crucial part in it. It's known as the industry body that gave wings to the IT revolution. It's your debut book and it's a bestseller as well. And I believe it has been three years in the making. So I'd love to hear more about the book from you. The book talks about, uh, you can say, how the fortunes of billion people change. That is a and I, I put my stake on the ground in the book saying it is the IT industry uh, that changed the fortunes of billion people. And uh, IT industry also changed, grew. Again, I, so I'm saying it is thanks to the role that NASCOM played in uh, making the entire environment in such a way that the IT industry uh, could grow at that rate. And then this book is about it. Uh, as I call it, secret sauce of NASCOM. That what is it that NASCOM has done? What are the values and the best practices that NASCOM has adopted that allow the IT industry to grow and in turn uh, change the fortunes of a billion people? Because today we do talk about India as an unstoppable engine driven by, let's say, startup world. So that's the message behind the book. And what prompted you to write it? What prompted me? Okay, that's a good question. In a sense that uh, I think maybe four or five years back, my daughter-in-law, Natasha, she would, I mean, she would, at the home, I talk about the great thing NASCOM is doing. So she said, we are talking about it, but I don't think the market knows about it. No one writes about it. No one uh, talks about it. I took her comment seriously. So that then looked at the books published by leading public sector uh, executives or officers, RBI governors, politicians. And the, I looked at the index page. Is the word NASCOM there? I was shocked. Not a single book had NASCOM as a in the index. Then I looked at technology as a word. Maybe one or two books had some reference here and there about the technology world. And I said, here are the individuals who were on top of the bureaucratic or the political uh, world in India for the last 30, 40 years. And they just don't know what is happening underneath partly. So now there is an African proverb which says that if the lions had historians, the stories of hunting would not have glorified the hunters. Right. So if nobody has written the story about NASCOM, no one knows about it. Now, I, for example, just as I said a little before, a few minutes before, that look back where India was the 32 years back when NASCOM started. We were known as a third world country. We were known as a snack charmers country. We had no foreign exchange. We were bankrupt, as a matter of fact. In 91, India had to mortgage gold to Bank of England to pay for some dollars for an import of oil at that time. Now, from that situation to today, with a larger population, and we are seeing, a, uh, let's say, unstoppable engine India has become. India has become a global tech powerhouse as it is being positioned. And look at some numbers. IT industry earned more than trillion dollars of foreign exchange over the last 20 years. Now, last year, the industry earned 175 billion dollars and by the way this number is more than what saudi arabia earns as a in oil uh, in export from saudi arabia the difference is in saudi arabia the money goes in one account while in india the money to thousands of companies goes in millions of accounts and millions meaning today industry employs 5.3 billion software engineers these are high paying high disposable income jobs each job or each person indirectly employs four to five additional people in the society. So if you look at that total number and they take an average family of four, our industry today supports twice the population of UK. Now look at the cultural 
the seeds of cultural transformation of our industry has planted. There was a time when, let's say, uh, today IIT Bombay, Bombay's gardener's son became a software engineer. And he became a software engineer because what he knew and what he studied, not because he knew someone to get a job. He knew software, he appeared for the test and he got the job. That meritocracy has been being injected by our industry in the country. Look at women employment. Today, out of 5.3, 37% are women employees, 2 million women employees. Now, just imagine if these women who are getting high disposable income, the freedom they enjoy, financial freedom they enjoy at home, how they're going to bring up their children, how they're going to contribute at the work, how they're going to change the community they live in. To me, it's a silent revolution taking place behind. Absolutely. So, now that's the sort of contribution of the industry at a, some cultural values, besides hardworking and delivering quality work and so on and so forth. Look at the transparency or the corporate governance standards employed by the industry. Uh, industry was the first to come up with following the world corp governance standards in, let's say, quarterly reports and the annual reports, which started building trust in India as a brand, as a trusted nation. And the FDI money started flowing in. Of course, starting with IT industry, now across all the industry uh, sectors. So that kind of revolutionary, in my view, change has been impacted by the IT industry. I could not find any other industry segment in the country which has contributed in the last say, 40 years or 30 years. Other industries that have contributed substantially, I would say, were indirectly supported by IT industry. In a sense, let's say, wherever the company comes up, the real estate would put up residences where the employees will buy the apartments there. Retail malls will come up because they have a capacity to buy. If they were driving a scooter, they start driving a car, buying through EMI and whatnot. Now, EMI and other schemes came from the banking industry and the banking industry group. Similarly, airports got expanded. Uh, similarly, people from tier two cities to tier three started coming in, tier one cities started. So all that change has been brought in by the industry. I didn't find really any other industry segment. So that's why I put my claim on the book saying, uh, it is the industry that has changed India. And that's what this Biotic Effect the book is about. Absolutely. The industry has had such a domino effect on yeah. shaping India's course. Um, so I'd like to know what the process of putting together the book was like. Because you are going back several <laughs> decades. Uh, I am not an author. I am not an historian. And I am not an economist. But this book had to highlight all three aspects. In a sense, if I put my claim on the ground saying IT industry change in India, it has to be backed up by economic numbers. If we create a new middle class, it has to be backed up. It is a definitely industry right. created the new middle class in the country. Similarly, it's a if I want to document the history of NASCOM, how NASCOM made change to IT industry. Now IT industry changed India. It needed to, I had to capture the history of last 30, 32 years. And it had to be captured in a way like an historian. Otherwise, there's no real fun about it. And the third is disclosing the secret source of NASCO. So I said, how do I tackle this job? It's like startup in a way. You have an idea and now you want to go and implement it. So you have an idea of writing a book. So like any other startup entrepreneur would do, I did the research about what is a good book, argument say. Who are the authors whom I really like and whose writings I like or the books I like. I talked to some of them, understood from them uh, what does a, what does make book uh, look good. I mean, reader appreciate. See, in India, nobody, frankly, nobody buys books. Nobody reads books. Those days are gone as such. But the, this document had to be prepared indirectly as a story, which is interesting for people to uh, read. 
So like that, there is a one uh, what you call guideline or a best practice in story writing that show but not tell. Yes. So you follow that. So like that, I collected those best practices, and now I said I need to put a whole team together of economists, researchers, uh, writers. I, I'm a. I believe I'm. I, I was a programmer myself years back. So I'm a. I'm good at details, and I can. I'm a good coder or some a good micromanager that way. So that kind of comfort, comfort and confidence I had. So I put the whole team together, and my daughter-in-law Natasha. I said, "You be the CEO or a project in charge of this." Uh, and over a time, we had six, seven people involved in writing the book. Of course, then there were made lots of ups and downs. Covid came in between, so that put in a, a big break. Plus, by design, I wanted to just go away from what I have written and go back after three weeks, four weeks, and take a fresh look. So all, all that we did, and then like a programmer in a way, you can say I make one change in one chapter somewhere. I'll see that uh, it is impacting it several other places in the book. So it's not like a like a spaghetti board in a way, but you have to fix it. So there has to be a consistency of flow in what you say, the choice of words, and we use number of software tools, frankly, to improve the quality or the readability of the book. There are software products which can measure the complexity of the uh, page or a chapter or a whatnot. So you decide where you want to put your level and what level of whether you expect, and based on that you change. So things like, for example, even you, if you write uh, say one dollar, you write one numeric and a dollar, or you write O N E and one dollar. Any one dollar is a simpler reading. The one yeah. as a character, it makes it a little harder to read. So, like this, a starting point to and bring in all those changes, including like we counted, and the software tells you how often the word NASCOM is used. So maybe it's a twelve hundred times. So let's bring it down to two hundred. Or the word technology, like that, we continuously we worked on the book from fifteen different angles. To improve the uh, readability and the impact that the reader should get coming out of the book, without compromising on show but not tell sort of uh, uh, principles, and and like we didn't had we had no idea, we didn't know the outcome from that perspective of uh, our expectations were much lower because we were told nobody buys the books and so on and so forth, and it turned out that the people loved the book. We can, as you just said, instant. Uh, not bestseller, and within a few months became national bookseller. Even after a year, the book is going very strong. So I'm very happy with the outcome that would be got out of the book. Yes, it's been very well received. I was curious to know whether you reached out to any of your peers uh, while recalling certain incidents from a few uh, decades or years ago for some details or their account of how See, things went a, down. If, if the book has to have a place in the history, one thing was very clear to me, and which again I read and understood, and I said we must follow that. It has to be truthful. Uh, there was a Gujarati writer named Gunwan Shah. He said that if you are not truthful, and you have to assume you are walking naked on the street. The book will be only read by a few of your friends and colleagues and whatnot. But if it is truthful, society will read. So in this book, we have gone to, you can say, miles in that sense from efforts to see that every sentence is a truthful statement. So people who were, luckily, most of the people who were involved in the industry are alive today. Every one of them read the book before it was published. So they all verified. I won't say verified, but they went through it, gave their comments. What they they say again? You're writing what happened 35 years back. I have a habit of writing personal notes. It helps me to reconstruct, but still may not be a proper uh, recollection. So collected the views of everybody, put them together, and it came out, including the critics of NASCOM. They also reviewed the book. 
So one of the critic reviewed the book. He gave me thirty-two suggestions. Oh wow! And simple things like I had said that digital equipment of our joint venture went public at BSC and NSC. He came back saying, Mr. Mehta, NSC didn't exist in 1988. Now with we never so to call writing you write both BSC and NSC. Not realizing when NSC took birth, for example. So we corrected that. I think one very another interesting statement was I had a statement which said India mortgage gold during Nasim Arav's government's time. He came back and said that's that's not a true statement. I I said no. Look at my research team's work. I sent him the Economic Times article, Times of India articles with the headline saying India. Sending gold to New England, or a Bank of England, and all. In the evening, he came back and he said, "Mr. Mehta, you are still wrong." As I talk, called uh, Yashwant Sinha, who was then Finance Minister of India, and Finance Minister, his first reaction was uh, on the subject, "Ki kyo mujhe wo dukhi bade din yad karate ho?" Because I am the one, Yashwant Sinha and Chandra Shekhar had signed that agreement. To mortgage gold from India to the Bank of England. Is after that our government fell. The first batch was airlifted at that time, and the second batch was airlifted during Narsimha Rao's time. So what you say is partly right. That's not how it happened. So I corrected that statement. But now, now that sentence is no relevant to the book as such. But from the reader's perspective, if they start suspecting even one sentence wrong, then they start suspecting. Maybe many more things could be wrong also, so we corrected that. So we put in that sort of meticulous effort in every way to make sure that the book is as close to uh, truth uh, as uh, uh, possible. And so I tell you, not a single suggestion I have received, except one I think, where there is a correction needed in the book. Okay, okay. I think it's very important for today's youth uh, and especially entrepreneurs in all fields to know about uh, this part of India's history and about the role NASCOM has played as well. So, uh, moving on. Manal, I, the point only is yeah. the way the book was done, like a pro, like a, a startup in a way. Yeah. Would all the questions. I found it fascinating. Bringing the management team together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't have a very KRAs and goals that way. Except the simple yeah. goal was that it has to be a successful book. In our eyes, there was no real standard for us to compare with in terms of, and there was no financial measurement either. But right. overall, as we say, you try to excel in the best that whatever you do, the results will be there, will come automatically. So that's a very important, I would say, learning for me as well as hopefully for others. If you put in your best effort, chances are great. That it will reach the end that you are trying to reach. Yeah, and right. I also believe that the book has a lot of uh, personal uh, anecdotes from you. So, what uh, prompted you to include like personal details in the book? It's almost like a biography in some ways. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's the pieces only of my biography in a sense that. So, see, when I decided to put a stake on the ground. If I don't put it my biography and ex- let's say in my way of saying it, uh, I didn't want anyone to challenge. I say if you don't agree with what I say, you write a book. If I am putting a stake on my on the ground saying IT industry change India, NASCOM change IT industry, you don't agree, you write a book on it. These are my views, and I'm giving you my stories. Let the reader decide what is the real stuff behind it. Now. I read a book, lots of books, and then I always find a lot of things missing in terms of the context. Like every Harvard Business article or every management article, some you like something great, but then you, but then you realize you don't know the full context. So is it really applicable to your environment? If you do not know the context, I don't know how is it applicable to you. So here also I realize that if I don't tell the readers what is in my mind, how who am I? And how I wrote this, and how I, when NASCOM started from my office, what was going through my mind at that point when the NASCOM was starting, and what all the challenges were there. So if I give them my views, at least the reader has some sense of what must be going through, and hope then hopefully reach some decision on it. So the idea was to 
bring in that personal piece to add uh, substance or, or sort of validation to the point that I was putting in.